Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Well, I thought our big Christmas program was last week. (laughs) I guess the worship team didn't hear that. They did, man. Yeah, right? Oh. Man, that was just, uh, I don't know about you, but man, that that hit the spot. It really did. Well, can I just say, I think... uh, I think we're the ones that are sticking around in Florida for Christmas, huh? Yeah? I think that's probably the case, right? By this point, if you haven't headed out of Florida, good luck. <laughs> I can tell you, because I tried to get back into Florida last night. Mm. Because uh, I was uh, up in North Carolina, went up uh, earlier this week to pick up my son from school. And uh, my parents live where my son is going to school. And so we spent a little bit of time with my parents uh, up in western North Carolina, a beautiful part of the country. But oh my goodness, can I just tell you, it's cold up there. I I did not remember it being so cold. I guess that's what, uh, you know, living in Florida does for you, huh? Anyway, yeah. So, uh, and I love it. Anyway, so I had a good time seeing my family. And then uh, we had some adventures getting back. Uh, That'll be a story for a different time. But I can genuinely tell you, because of the adventures getting back here, it is truly good to be home for Christmas. You know, when you think that you might not be able to make it because of mishaps and whatnot, that's, that's not a good feeling. It's good to go home, right? It's good to be home. And, and home, I'm discovering as I get a little older, home is where the people that you love are at, right? The, but, there's, but can I also just say, Home is like where you're, you're comfortable too, like, right? You know, like it, it's, there is your own space. Because like, I know that all the people I love will not be with me for Christmas, but I am home. Does that make sense? Is anybody else tracking with me on that? Okay, good. I, just random thoughts with Ken. Um, <laughs> or is it? All right, we'll find out as we go. So for some of you, um, this is your first Saturday to ever walk into this building, and you do not know where we've been and where we're going. So um, for others of you, you've been here a long time, a long, long time. And some of you have heard the entire series of the sermons, but I just want to go through for all of us and just do a little refresher on where we've been this Christmas season. Because our theme for this Christmas season has been come and see. It's that invitation to come and see Jesus, the baby Jesus. And at the very beginning of the series, I told you that one of the things I really wanted you to think about is that this series is, we're reflecting on history, yes. With that said, if you don't do anything with what you understand about history, you're really missing out. One of the the beautiful things about history is you learn from it and you can apply it to the future. And so one of the things I suggested to you is that as we contemplate Jesus' first advent, his coming as a baby to this earth, it might be worthwhile for us to see what lessons we can learn as we think about Jesus coming again, his second advent. And what can we learn from that first advent to apply to the second advent? And so we've been doing a series of sermons that we've called Come and See. And in the first sermon, we said, come and see what God can do. And we went through a list of all the people that, that chose to accept the invitation to come see the baby Jesus. And we talked about some of the people who didn't choose to accept the invitation. And what we realized is that there were some really, really miraculous things that happened to invite people to come to see Jesus. But in some people's cases, there was nothing miraculous about it. It was just a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. And what we determined that is that when God works in our lives, it doesn't have to always be big 
crowds of angels and spectacular, but sometimes God's greatest promptings are that small, still voice that God can speak in and speak into our lives. And, and maybe that what God is hoping that we can kind of move towards is a faith that doesn't need the spectacular, but can accept the everyday. So that was what we did in our first sermon. And then in our second sermon, we talked about come and see what God will do. And we talked about the fact that the wise men were tricked by Herod. And there's a lot of us living in the world today who are really afraid of being tricked. And there's good reason for that. There are a lot of scams in the world today, right? There's, it is easy to be fooled. It really is. And so sometimes, though, I find that Christians become so hung up on not being fooled. They get so hung up on the conspiracies that they forget that God is ultimately the one who saves us, not ourselves. And so in that one, we talked about how the Magi, very smart people, wise men, they're called wise men, right? So, I mean, smart people. And they're fooled by Herod. They completely fall for what he has to say because he wants to kill the baby Jesus. They fall for it. And they don't out-intellectualize it. They don't go down. They say, well, let's think about what Herod said to us. I wonder if they don't do that. Instead, God speaks to them and says, you need to go home a different way. And they simply listen to what God has to say. And so what we've learned from that is that if we put ourselves in God's hands, we don't have to fear conspiracies. We don't have to fear people tricking us. What we do is we put ourselves in God's hand and allow God to be in control of our lives. And so we found that God, by the way, will never fail us. He won't. Are there times that horrible things happen? Absolutely. But God never fails. God never fails. And so that's what we know. God will never fail. Last week, we talked about come and see what God has done. We talked about the baby Jesus. And we talked about why it was that this baby was born to poor parents, humble circumstances. Why didn't God, you know, provide a little bit better for his son, right? At least a middle-class family. And one of the things that we really discussed about that is that it, that God was sending a loud and clear message through how his son was born and to whom he was born about the fact that God wants everyone to have access to himself. Why? Because if Jesus had been born to rich parents, they would have had bodyguards and walls that would have kept people like the shepherds away from the baby Jesus. Even a middle-class family probably would have tried to figure out some way. But when you are born and placed in the feeding trough of animals, it is hard to keep anybody away because even the animals are there. And this is a loud and clear message from God. It's not a new message. It's the message God has wanted humanity to understand from the beginning that God wants us to enjoy the access that God has granted to each of us. So what has God done? God has given us access. God has given us access to the God of the universe. It's an incredible thought. So finally today, I want to finish off with a sermon on what does God want you to do? So now that we've talked about all these different things, you know, the real question is, now what? Do we have another good Christmas? Do we just move on our way? Now what? What does God want you to do as we enjoy Christmas very soon? What does God want now? And so I thought maybe we could just circle back around to the first sermon. If you are here for that first sermon, you'll know that one of the things I did is I asked you to tell me people who accepted God's invitation to come and see the baby Jesus. And I asked you to tell me people who were given the invitation but weren't able to come and see. And so when I did that, I want us to, um, to think about who those people were and answer the question for them, now what? Now what? What did they do after they met the baby Jesus? So let's go ahead and start off with Zachariah and Elizabeth because they're really where the story kind of starts. So Zachariah and Elizabeth, if you don't remember, these are the parents of John, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was born to prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah. And Mary actually goes on a trip to visit Elizabeth 
Both of them are pregnant. And when Mary shows up, the baby that Elizabeth is carrying basically jumps for joy in the womb. I can't imagine that was comfortable, but it's what the Bible says happened. And reacting to the presence of Jesus. So what did Mary do after visiting with Zachariah and Elizabeth? She goes home. What do they do? I get it. You guys, were, you guys were talking a minute ago, but this one's got you stumped. I think they stayed home. Let's go with it. They stayed home, right? I don't see them doing anything else. Text doesn't say they did anything else. Doesn't say that they went on a missionary excursion. Doesn't say that they just, they, they kind of stayed home. That's what it looks like to me from the text. So, speaking to Mary and Joseph, let's talk about them. So, Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she is going to have a child. Where's she at when Gabriel says that? In a village called Nazareth in Galilee. Yep. So they are in the county of Galilee, the town of Nazareth. Okay? So Mary's told that. So then for those of you who are not super familiar with the Christmas story, um, Mary and Joseph, who are engaged... Joseph has to go because the taxes, the way the taxes worked, he had to go to the town that uh, his family is from, which is Bethlehem. So they make this journey to Bethlehem. This is where Jesus is born. They stay in Bethlehem for a bit, probably somewhere between one and two years. Uh, The wise men, Magi, come and visit them. Then an angel shows up and tells Joseph, Herod's going to try to kill the baby. You need to get out of here. They go to Egypt. And then once Herod dies, what do they do? Who said it? Say it louder. What did they do? They went home. So Mary and Joseph, at the end of the story, at the end of that part of the story, the Christmas story, they they go home. Okay. So let's talk about some other folks. How about um, the shepherds? What do they do after they see the baby Jesus? Some of you begin to catch on to the trend. They praise God and go home. How about those wise men? What do they do? They go home. Um, How about about Anna and Simeon? The Bible doesn't really say, so we're going to assume they went home. Right? Some of you are feeling super confused right now. This can't, where's Ken going with this? (laughs) <laughs> going home. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So then what is, so come and see what God wants you to do. What does God want you to do? Go home. That's an excellent guess. But then some of you are going to say that can't be right. Once you've met Jesus... Jesus doesn't tell you to go home. What does Jesus tell you to do? Jesus tells you to make disciples and go to all the world. So why did all those other people go home? And why is Jesus at the end of his ministry telling them to go into all the world and make disciples? Which is it? What does God want from you? Go home or go into the world? Well, I think that while you're pondering this, and I love that you're, you're thinking actively, because I can hear it, and it's awesome. I think that there's a non-Christmas story that may help us understand a little bit about what God may want from us when it comes to having an encounter with Jesus. So let's go ahead and talk about this, this particular story. This particular story that I want to tell you about is found in Matthew chap- Mark chapter 5, pardon me. And in the story, Jesus comes to this region across the Lake of Galilee. It's a region that doesn't, you know, it's a, a, a land that doesn't have a lot of believers in it, if you will, okay? And when Jesus gets there, he encounters a man who is possessed by a demon. This man has been a complete and utter wreck of a life. And Jesus casts the demon out of this man. And in Mark chapter 5, 18 through 20, Jesus 
after he cast the demon out of the man, the man says, hey, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you. Let me get back in the boat with you and just go wherever you go and do whatever you want me to do. And Jesus says, go home. He says, no. And I have to imagine that Jesus said it with tenderness and compassion, because apparently during first service, I made it sound like Jesus was angry. He wasn't angry. I just like to emphasize the fact that Jesus said no. And I'm sure that man didn't hear it in a soft way. I'm sure that man was eager to not go home. Because there are a few of us here today who understand why you might not want to go home if you've been demon-possessed. There's a few of us here today who, who, when you are saying, are you going to go home for Christmas, your thought is, no chance. Not going to do it. Wherever home is, wherever you grew up, whatever you, you're like, no, I don't want to go back there. I'm ashamed of who I was when I was there. I don't ever want to see those people again and have to live, you know, explain myself. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go home. I'm a different person now. I want to be in a different place. And I'm sure that's exactly how this demon, this formerly demon-possessed man felt. I'm sure he felt like, I don't want to go home. I want to go with you. You're the guy who changed me. You're the guy that's made all the difference in the world. I don't even... Why go home now? I mean, you just threw the demon out. There's a lot for me to learn yet. There's a lot. I mean, we, we probably need to at least do, you know, a, an 11-week evangelistic, you know, preparation, something, you know, before I go home. And that can't be right. I have to, you need to train me, Jesus. You need to, and Jesus says simply, no, no. What I need from you is I need you to go home and I need you to tell what I've done for you and how merciful I have been to you. That's what I need you to do. I need you to go home. It occurs to me that going home is one of the hardest but maybe most important things we can do when we meet Jesus. And the reason is because all those people who knew that man when he was demon-possessed now encountered something completely different. A man who had been changed. And perhaps his life was going to speak in ways that Jesus can you imagine this? And just stop and think about this for a second. Jesus, son of God, this man could get through to the people in his home better than Jesus could. Stop and think about that for a minute. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus was working through that man. But that man, that man had the power to help the people in his home know who Jesus was. And what we see is that when Jesus does go back to that area again, the people flock to him. The crowds overwhelm him because that man went home. He didn't do what was comfortable and what he would have liked to do, which is get in the boat with Jesus and just be with Jesus. He recognized that when Jesus says, go and just tell what I've done for you, that is enough. As a pastor at Whole Life Church, and throughout my career as a pastor, I will have people come to me and say, Ken, I have a neighbor, I have a child, I have a friend that would love to do Bible studies with you. Will you do Bible studies with them? And when I'm at my best, I say no. When it's about me and my ego, I'll often say yes. But when it's about Jesus, I say, no, I want you to tell them. I want you to study the Bible with them. And what I'll often hear back is, oh, I, I, I don't, I mean, you're the one with the theology degree. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you, you'll know that's a joke later. But anyway, um, <laughs> and they'll say, you're the one, you know, you're the pastor. And my answer is, go home. And tell the good things that God has done for you. 
Have you discovered what a blessing the Sabbath is? Go home and talk about why a day of rest is a blessing for you. Have you discovered that Jesus has grace and mercy and acceptance for you? Go home and talk about it. Have you discovered that when somebody dies, they don't go straight to hell or to heaven, that they just rest? That there isn't a God that's eager to put people into eternal torment? That seems like good news. Go home and talk about it. Go home. And by the way, some of you are going to say, but I would never know how to, I mean, what if they, what if they challenge me on this? What if they, great. It's okay to say, I don't know. I'm not sure. You ask a question I don't know the answer to. But I know some people that I could ask the question to. And I'll come back and tell you what they said. And I'll tell you what I've researched. And I can tell you more about it. You know why? Because I'll tell you this. The world that we live in today, more than ever, people don't trust people that look like me. They trust you. Because you're their friend. You're their mother. You're their father. You're their cousin. You're their next door neighbor. You're the person that helped them when they needed help. And if God has done good things in your life, go home and talk about it. Sometimes God does call us to go to the ends of the earth, to leave our home and go places. That's a fact. But I find in the biblical count, what's overlooked is more often than not, God asks us to go home. God asks us to go back to our family, to our parents, to our children, to our cousins, to our nieces, nephews, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to go home and tell about the good things that God has done in our life. And there's a reason why those, <laughs> there's a reason why those shepherds went home glorifying God because they'd met Jesus. And if you've met Jesus, it's hard not to talk about him. If you love Jesus, it's hard not to talk about. You know, anytime you meet an amazing person, you want the other important people in your life to get to know that person. Go home. Go home and talk about the good things that you've encountered in our worship service here at Whole Life. Talk about the good things that God has done for you during the week. Talk about the mercy that you've experienced that you didn't deserve. Did you grow up in a Christian family all your life and you've never really strayed off the path? You've just always going to go home and talk about how incredibly blessed you've been to not have to suffer the way so many people have had to suffer. That's a testimony. Have you suffered? Talk about how God brought you out of that suffering. There are people that need Jesus that are in your home. They need Jesus and they will meet Jesus through you, through you and through your testimony. So today, whether you've been called to go far and create a new home afar, or whether you've been called to the home that you're in currently, I want to remind you that God is full of grace and mercy. It is in, on display this Christmas. As you celebrate Christmas, remember the ultimate gift that was given. God himself gave himself to us. God is full of mercy and grace. And God has done amazing things for us. And I am looking forward. I am looking forward to the ultimate go home day. When Jesus comes back, that second advent. And before that happens, I want to go to the home I'm in now and make sure that everybody's ready to go home there too. What do you say we go home? Merry Christmas, Ken. Merry Christmas, Haas. I I'm feel you like you're more festive than I am. <laughs> Just a little bit. You know, well, our family's always a little extra, so it's I love okay. it. I love it. It's okay. Um, I, we actually have questions this time, unlike this morning. Haas, you so. put those glasses on. I just wanted to sit on your lap and ask for presents. I really, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, 
You, just, you put it's like it felt like a. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's anyway. Okay. <laughs> Good so luck getting back on track now. It says, "I learned an experience that God has no more uh, has no more than yes. It is. Is it safe to say that we need to learn the expect? Oh, sorry. Is it safe to say that we need to learn the the accept to accept?" The no before God says yes. Ooh, I love that. I think that we need to learn to accept whatever God says for sure. Um, and I think that's a really, I love that observation. But yeah, I think that, I think that we need to be ready to accept the unexpected because God seems to have, it of, have a habit of throwing the unexpected at us. So yeah, I think what a great question. I love that. And I, I love the way, I, I, I don't know if you took the question that I asked, asked for you, for those of you who don't know, this morning we didn't have any questions, so I actually asked Ken a question of what happens for those people who feel that their life isn't, uh, doesn't have enough to, to kind of share their story, they don't feel that God has moved through their, through their life, right? And I love the way in your sermon how, how you brought it all, all together, right? If, if you've never gone through anything, that's something to praise God about, that's something to share with with, uh, with other people, just to look at those little details in our lives that a lot of us take for granted, but, but just sharing that with some, someone at the right moment that you may not know can yeah. really kind of change and, and help them see Jesus through Absolutely. That. I love it. Yeah, for sure. And, and can I say that, you know, you never know how the little things that you say will make a difference. Um, home is a a warm word for me. I don't know. I, I'm sure for others it's not. I think there, I'm sure if you grew up in a, in a home that wasn't pleasant, that it might not have the warmth that I feel when I hear that word because I did grow up in a warm home um, with parents who really cared about me and, and took care of me and loved me. Um, and so for me, that, that word home is, is a really powerful one. And it's one of the reasons why I use the word family a lot because family is really incredibly important and meaningful to me. And, and families and homes. And so we put those things together. And so I remember um, in the first service, I said it during the sermon. Second service, I didn't. But I want to go ahead and circle back for just a second. One of the powerful things that happened for me when, I, when thinking about going home was my first Saturday, my first Sabbath in this church. Um, at the end of the service, um, the worship team sang the blessing and then uh, you, the congregation, were invited to come up and put your hands on um, my family, myself. And one of the most meaningful things to me was the first person to say it, and there were other people who did too, but the first person that I recall saying it to me, Ken Bradley, who's just sitting right back that way, I'll just point at him. Uh, Ken Bradley walked up to me and said, welcome home. And I don't know if Ken could have understood how, a, how deep and powerful that was for me to be welcomed home. Sometimes as a pastor, you'll go into a church and you're not really sure if that's home. And so it was incredibly deep and meaningful to me to be welcomed home. And I think about that just in the same context of each one of us can say little things to other people when we go home. To what, and when I say that home, it's that general idea of it's what, your circle of influence, your work, your home with, with the family that you're, you know, the people that you're living with, the, the, the people that you do life with, that when you go home and invite them into relationship and into home, that's a powerful thing. And little words shouldn't be over overlooked because they really can make a huge difference. And it was one of the things that from, it felt like from day one, I just, this is home. I'm home. It feels good. And so I hope each one of you experienced that here at Whole Life too. We want you to experience home here. Well, thank you, Ken, so much again for, the, for this lovely series and for the, today's message. And for those of you who are watching online, if you still have more questions, you can still submit those to us. Pastor Ken will be happy to answer them on Wednesdays. This is Whole Life uh, Podcast. So uh, thank you so much, and just keep those questions coming. Thank you, Haas. Appreciate it. Have a good Christmas. You too. Yeah, you're ready for it. <laughs> um, I know maybe some of you aren't ready for it. Maybe you have a little bit more Christmas shopping to do. 
uh, or whatever's on your list, Christmas baking or whatever it may be, I'd like to still invite you um, and just give you an invitation to come home to your whole life family on Christmas Eve. That would be tomorrow evening. Um, at five o'clock, we open the doors. And if you'd like to do foot washing, we do that from five to six. And then at six o'clock, we go into a Christmas Eve communion service. Here's my promise to you. If you're like me and you show up at a Christmas Eve program, one of the thoughts in your head is, I wanna get home to my family. I don't, wanna be, I don't wanna go to a service that is going to go on and I wonder when it's ever going to end. So here's the thing. If you come, I promise you, we will be done in an hour. And I just invite you to come and be with your, your family here if you can, and then go home and enjoy your Christmas program with your family there. So go ahead and, uh, and consider that tomorrow. I'd really love, love to spend the first little part of Christmas with you. Um, so my family and I would love to share that with you if you're open and available to be able to do that. And by the way, if you have relatives visiting, bring them along, they'll thank you. All right. So, I, do I need to say, are you, are you here to, okay, just sometimes when a bell comes, it means I forgot to do something. So I just wanted to make sure that I was on my game. Okay. Um, if, you brought, uh, if you brought cinnamon rolls and you brought it in a non-disposable pan that you want to get back, make sure that you check in before you leave on that. If there are leftovers, please take them home. I do not need to gain any more Christmas weight. So um, please take those back with you and enjoy those. And then uh, next week, uh, we will be closing off 2023, last Sabbath of 2023, an incredible year. Um, and uh, the sermon is called Reflections. We're going to reflect on the year that has been. We're going to take a walk through the journey that we've been on, through uh, the different things that have happened here at Whole Life, but also where we've been spiritually. I'm going to kind of walk you through the sermon series. And I hope that you'll be able, if you haven't already realized it, see the progression of where we've been going um, as we've talked about that together. And so that's going to be next week. Also, you don't want to miss it. We've got a year in review video that's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss that. So be here for that. So those are the things that are happening. I look forward to, to seeing you uh, hopefully tomorrow evening and then for sure, hopefully next week. Um, and let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath together. We thank you for your love, for your mercy. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus was born. We thank you for the lessons that we learn. We thank you that we have access. And Lord, help us not to forget to tell other people that they have access to. Help us to go home and say, hey, you've got access. You've got access to God and a better life and a better eternity. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, family. Merry Christmas. I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians. All focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.